Thank you. Good morning. I had no idea I was going to do this today. Thanks, Tisa. Uh, I'm pretty good at public speaking, but public reading, uh, I get a little tripped up, so uh, bear with me. Is this the double side? I asked. Tisa, I asked. Do I have to read it all? <laughs> okay. So uh, let's start. So uh, if I stutter or anything, I feel a little bit like Moses, except for he had to speak to all of Israel, and I'm just speaking with you guys. I'm a little nervous here. All right, week two, peace. The roots of Advent start during the Middle Ages, perhaps as far back as the 4th or 5th century AD. But the Advent candle wreath we've come to know today has solid historical origins from the 1800s onward. Each of the five candles represented, represents something different, an important element in the coming of Christ and our expectation of him. There are three purple candles, hope, peace, joy, a pink candle, love, and a white candle, Christ, represent the five elements of the Christmas story. This week, we'll cover Advent week two, the candle of peace. The Hebrew word for peace, shalom, goes far beyond not fighting with others, or peace as we know it, shalom, in essence, how things are meant to be, a slice of heaven. The peace of God allows us to look at others through heaven's eyes and help guide the world to see God's here and not yet here kingdom. Sing to Yahweh, you his faithful ones, and praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor a lifetime. Weeping may spend the night, but there is joy in the morning. When I was secure, I said, I will never be shaken. That's Psalms 30, 4 through 6. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and announce to her that her time of forced labor is over. Her iniquity has been pardoned, and she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one crying out, prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Make a straight highway for our God in the desert. Isaiah 40, 1 through 3. <clears throat> Prayer. Heavenly Father, you are the God who gives peace, regardless of our circumstances or our situations. You offer us peace that passes understanding. That first Christmas when you sent your son, you sent the one who is called Wonderful, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Even the angels cried out, glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. The angels knew your purpose, Emmanuel, God with us as the baby Jesus. That baby would grow to be the same God-man, Jesus, who would again humble himself to face death on a cruel cross as payment for our sin. He would triumphantly defeat sin and death and hell in order to cancel our sin debt and reconcile us to you, Father. You exalted him and gave him a name above all names, where every knee in heaven and earth and under the earth must bow to the name of Jesus. The winds and waves obey him. He rules and reigns as king over all. No situation or circumstance that we find ourselves in is a match for Jesus. Amen. Amen. We began last week by asking, what was the world like when Jesus was born? Into what kind of world did he get born into? And what were the hopes and fears that people lived with all those years? And were the hopes and fears... What were they on that very first Christmas morning that Jesus was born into? And, and part of the answer came in the reality. We started last week talking about two different kings, two kings who embody the kind of kingdoms of the world, the best that the world has to offer, two men who represented them and uh, who were in power at the time that Jesus was born, that very first Christmas morning. And the two kings, they represented the best that the world could offer the best that we as humans could become and that we could produce, that we would look up to, that we would aspire to, that we would want to run the world, especially in, as this relates to power, 
which is what the kingdoms of this world are into, and the kingdoms of this world are into, if they can, absolute godlike power embodied in people like Caesar Augustus, who we talked about last week in Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And then there was wealth. There was mind-boggling wealth that is embodied in Herod, who we're going to talk about today. Matthew 2, 1, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. And that is what the world was like when Jesus was born, right there. But what were people afraid of on that very first morning? And, and, and it is these two rulers. People were scared of Caesar Augustus, and people were very scared of King Herod. And if Caesar Augustus, if he was symbolically, if he represented people and systems who used their power to crush and control then Herod, what he would symbolize and embody are people or systems who use wealth to exploit others. And not just to exploit and make people poor, but to keep people poor, making Christmas far more than just a story about figgy pudding and sleigh bells that ring. And this Christmas story, what it is, is it is it's an invasion of a different kind of king, a different kind of kingdom, which then makes me start to ask the question about the Christmas story, which king is it that I serve, which king do you serve, and which king or kingdom do you want to serve, because we have a choice who it is that we serve and who we follow. Many historians consider uh, Herod to be the wealthiest man alive in the world at the time that Jesus was born. Possibly the wealthiest man who has ever lived, it is speculated. The possibility uh, of that, because he was a, a master builder, he was a great politician, he was also a ruthless killer who was driven by paranoid jealousy. He was responsible for the slaughter of the innocents, which is when King Herod heard that the Jews, uh, the king of the Jews was born, when the wise men came, and they said, hey, we're coming to see the king of the Jews that is just born. He got very jealous, he got very angry, and so what he did is he had every male infant under the age of two slaughtered in the Bethlehem area in Israel, because his paranoia and his jealousy would quickly rise to this fevered pitch. He even killed one of his sons when he heard that that son might be plotting to take over his throne. The plot was not true, but he wanted to make sure and took care of it. He had several wives, roughly it's estimated about 11 wives. He had one of them killed, and he had her killed because he thought that she was plotting against him, though she wasn't, and in fact she was the only wife of the 11, that it's believed that she actually loved him back that he had any kind of intimate relationship with. But his grip on the kingdom was far more important than the love of the woman. When he came close to his own death, late in his life, he had all of the most loved and respected and honored dignitaries in Jerusalem picked up, caught, and put in prison with the orders to his army that upon my death, these men, every single one of them, are to be killed he was determined that on the day that he dies in the country that he lived in, that everyone would weep on that day. And he knew that no one would cry over his death, so he wanted to make sure that there was grieving and wailing and sadness on the day that he died. He'd been appointed by Caesar Augustus to rule as the man in Israel at about 40 years before Jesus was born. And to honor Caesar, he then started to have statues built in honor of Caesar, Caesar that looked like him. And he built altars with this, the Greek inscription before Jesus was ever born with inscriptions saying, Jesus is Lord, which translated into Hebrew, God is salvation, saying Caesar is God. And in the land of the Jews, where any kind of uh, idol or an object that represents a God would be an abomination, even if it was the true God, the God of creation, the God of Abraham and Moses, let alone someone who is absolutely offensive, another ruler of another country, that would have been beyond offensive. And in Israel, where King Herod ruled, the world that Jesus was born into, he was more than 
feared he was hated because he would do these things that were just abomination to the Jewish faith. He made his money through a crippling taxation. So there was a very small group of very wealthy people left over because of the taxation, and a very large group of people that were poor estimated up in the high 90s, 97%, 98% poverty in the country. Under his rule, the people of Israel lived under the burden of taxes. You had the Roman uh, tribute tax. You had the Herod tax. He had his own tax. You had the transit trade tax, the market exchange tax, and you had the temple tax tax, all of those adding up. There was a fish and grain tax that was a huge burden on the people. That one tax alone was 50% tax. So if you were someone who was a farmer and you would bring in the grain, you would immediately have to turn 50% of it over even before you paid all the other taxes. If you were a fisherman, you would bring in the hull, and you would have people waiting there, and they would take 50% of the fish that you caught. It was a tremendous burden on the culture at the time. And because Israel was this agricultural society, they lived off of the things they grew and the fish that they caught. So let's say that you're a peasant in the time that Jesus was born, and you've been out all day, and you've been working, and you've been sweating, and you've been doing everything that you can to put food on the table for your family. You pull into the dock with your catch of fish, and standing there waiting for you would be a tax gatherer and soldiers nearby. And you're like, man, I hate those guys. And you grew to despise them because they were being backed by the authority of the soldiers of Rome. And he was empowered to take 50% of what it is that you brought and caught right at that very moment. As you're unloading it, because he's not going to do the work, you do the work, but you put it in a special area, and that is for that's for Herod and that is for Rome. And because he had the backing of Herod, well, really, we're going to take a little bit more because if you don't like what I'm saying, because I, I want more than 50%, I want a little bit more off the top because I want to feed my family. I want to get a little bit more. And the thing is, I got soldiers. You don't like what I'm going to tax you. I will let the soldiers deal with this. And then whatever is left, then that is what you get to take home to your family. So it would be three fish for Herod, two fish for me as the tax gatherer, and maybe one fish for you and your family. Ten fish for Herod, seven for me, three for you. A hundred fish for Herod, ninety for me, ten for you. And that is how they would do it. And people were starving because of the tax burden that was being placed upon them. Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, he records that it got so bad that at one point this delegation uh, decided we need to raise our voice up. So they would send this delegation from Jerusalem to go to Rome to meet with Caesar Augustus to complain about the living conditions and the taxation and the problems that they had in Israel, saying this is not a good way to run a government. We need you to stop. And, and, and so they got to there and they said, hey, Herod has reduced us to absolute poverty while he is building hot tubs on Masada. And that was the kind of anger that they had. But the way that, that, that Herod was building hot tubs on Masada was by overtaxing people, a very small group of people getting very wealthy and a large group of people getting less and less and less. In the history of the Jews, there was uh, their greatest king that the, every Jew Without a doubt, they all submitted to, we acknowledge, we support, we just go, yes. Many, many years in the history before this, you had this great king, King David. Everyone loves, oh, King David, oh, King David. But before David was the king, he had spent years running and hiding from King Saul, and he would live in the wilderness of Israel in the desert, living in caves, and where he hid out were these mountains in the desert living in these caves, and it was close to a place called Masada. And in a way to be mean to the Jews, to spite the Jews, to offend every Jew, and to do it on purpose, because it's so fun to mess with the Jews, Herod said, well, if your greatest king lived and hid out like animals around Masada, well, I, the king, I... <laughs> that you hate, I'm going to live in luxury on top of that mountain. I'm just going to do it to mess with you. So he built this three-story palace on the top of a mountain in the middle of a desert. It's incredible how he got all the supplies and materials on the top. It was this huge marvel of effort 
that they put into it. And they had a temple up there, and, in, and, and the temple, not to the Jewish God, obviously, and, and, and they had these enormous basins dug into, into the rock to hold thousands upon thousands of gallons of water, and they had storage facilities for food so that you could actually live up there for years and never need to come off of that mountain. The place was covered with tiles, inlaid mosaics all over the place. Italian columns of solid marble were shipped in from Rome. Hot and cold water were, br were brought in and, and plumbed into that, and hot tubs on the roof of the palace. There was a pool on the top of the palace, but the only problem was there's no water because you're in a desert. There's absolutely no rain. So he built, a in the desert, a, a system of 17 miles of of why is the word now not coming to me? Aqueducts to bring in water from as far away as Jerusalem. Has anyone ever been to Masada? Has anyone been there? We've got one. I've been there a couple times. I thought Brian the Hornbacks might have made it down into the desert. He made these enormous irrigation channels and redirected water from different wadis, but they went as far, which, and wadis are these deep ravines in the desert where streams would gather. So, yea, though I walk through a valley, a shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That means they're walking in a wadi. For God, you're with me. But the problem about a wadi is that that is where death, that's where all the animals want to come. That's where the lions and the, the tigers and bears, oh my, they would want to go down in there. But that's also where I, I need to, I, if I'm going to live, I need to get water. That's where I have to go. And so, yea, though I walk through this valley, because there's these deep ravines with a shadow of death, meaning because that's where all my enemies are going to be, because we're all trying to find water, because we're all trying to survive. But God, you're going to go with me. And then you have in the New Testament uh, about the wise man building his house on the, uh, on the, the rock and the, the fool on the sand. Well, the, the wise man is going to build on the rock above a wadi right in the beating sun in the 100-degree weather where you're going to get cooked, but you're going to live. You can always spend every day walking up and down and going up and out of these things, but if you are a fool, you will live down in the wadi because, oh, it's so beautiful. It's peaceful. It's cool. It's, you can get water just right outside your door, but when the floods come, whew, that's where you get flushed right out and you're going to die. So if you're smart, you're going to live within the pain, but that is what a wadi is. So he would take out of all these wadis and as far away as Jerusalem, he would have water redirected in such a way so that when it ever did rain, water from as far away as Jerusalem could all be channeled all the way to find into these, it would flow into huge cisterns built out of the enormous rock at the bottom of Masada, and then they would have another system of pulleys to get it brought up to the top to the other cisterns. He found a way to preserve uh, figs and dates in such a way that archaeologists exploring the site, they found them 2,000 years later still edible though I'm not the one who's going to try that one. <laughs> At one point, he thought, I want to build a city, and I want to build it along the coastline. Uh, I think I can make a lot of money if I just start to redirect the shipping lines through a certain area of land. The problem is the land that he wanted to build was, it was unbuildable. It was too swampy. So he rebuilt the coastline. I mean, that's what most of us would do. We would rebuild the coastline. He drained the marshes and built 520-acre harbor with concrete that he had brought in from Italy and poured it that went down to the 80 feet down under the ocean surface, and it was 100 feet wide, and he did this 2,000 years ago. He built an enormous sewage system that would drain away with all of the tides, and the nearest freshwater source also was 19 miles away. So he built aqueducts in Caesarea, and it would descend one centimeter for every meter for 19 miles. And Caesarea, he named after Caesar, because he said, I need to keep really good relations with Rome. I'm going to make so much money, but I need to keep Caesar happy, so we'll name it after him. And then I can do whatever it is that I want to do, because he was a master politician, and he's not going to mess with me and my wealth if I do something to honor him. Herod was interested in two things, himself and himself. He didn't actually care about Caesar. He just needed Caesar to keep supporting his rulership of Israel. And then one day, Herod, he gets out on a boat, 
and he loves his new town of Caesarea. It's this beautiful town right on the coast. He loves the weather, loves the, the fresh fish, and you just go out there, and he gets out on a boat. He's going, tooling around outside, and he looks back at the city that he just had built. Beautiful city, I love it, but something is wrong. I don't like the way it looks from the water. So let's cover the entire city, everything in marble. And to this day, if you walk around, you will find shards of marble like gravel from when the city was destroyed in 70 AD. It's just, it's everywhere. Did you guys go to Caesarea? No. Caesarea, you did. And it's just, everyone, every tourist walks around just, I mean, it's like, what do I do with all this? You don't do, it's too much. It's just, the marble is everywhere. He dreamed big. He hired or enslaved everyone to fulfill what it is that he envisioned all of these magnificent projects, everything he did, he was going to do big. But his favorite thing that he built, his biggest structure, was the Herodian, a palace that he named after himself. He wanted to build a palace between Jerusalem and his hometown in Edom. So he picked this spot in between the two, right in the middle. But the problem is there wasn't a mountain there. And that is a problem if you want everyone to know that you are king. So He built a mountain there, and that is the mountain that he built from nothing. And there were these two hills that were next to each other, and on the backs of a million Jewish slaves, he had one moved and built and put right on top of the other, creating a mountain. The Herodian, his palace, at the bottom of it, he had this pool nine feet deep with a gazebo right in the middle, and the only way to get to it is you had to take a boat. So you got this nice little boat ride, and you had people that would take you around. He did everything big. He had uh, an arena uh, that he would be able to have gladiator races and gladiator fights. He would reenact incredible battles and let everyone slaughter and kill themselves, but it was so big that one of the things he decided, and when he had it built, it has to be able to be filled with water so that not only do we have gladiator battles and reenactments of famous wars, we can also have war battles in the naval, the naval battles. So they would flood the arena, put boats in it, and have actual boats reenact great fights and killing everyone. He had so much wealth and so much power, unquestioned power, unquestioned wealth. He was the man. One day Jesus was with his disciples, and he was on a spot on the Mount of Olives where you have this view of the Herodian uh, mountain and the palace where it was. And, and from that spot, looking at the palace, Jesus said to his disciples, he said the most amazing thing. He said in Mark 11, he said, then Jesus said to the disciples, have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. And the disciples might have said, yeah, right. That, that doesn't work, Jesus. Because the mountain that Jesus was talking about, everyone knew. Everyone knew. Because it wasn't just any mountain. Jesus wasn't just giving some principle about some random mountain saying, if you have the power of faith, if you just believe enough, if you really believe that God can do it, if you just believe, then you can say to this mountain, move and it will. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about that kind of faith. He's talking about the Herod mountain. This is what you can do, the power and strength that is carried on the backs of a million Jewish slaves. Jesus is talking about a system, a kingdom of the world. This kingdom that as we look around looks so good. It, it, is, it is so powerful and it is insurmountable. And it looks like this kingdom is never going to end. But you need to know that they're going to go down if you believe and enter into a different kind of kingdom, if you enter into the kingdom that I'm talking about, but the thing is, you still, don't, you, still don't, you still don't get it. And it's so confusing. I get it. I get it. You don't see it yet. But I need you to hear this now. The kingdom that I am bringing, when it comes, the kingdom of God, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a mustard seed. And it, and it looks like a little baby. And it looks so small and so insignificant. But if you believe it and if you trust in this kingdom, if you enter into this much bigger kingdom than this tiny, this tiny little mountain, because this 
This one can get thrown into the sea, and I promise you that. That is how small King Herod's kingdom is. And that is the Christmas story. It's not Santa Claus or sleigh bells, not idyllic scenes of winter wonderland, though, though there's absolutely nothing wrong with any of that, and I absolutely love it. But the Christmas story, and don't be confused, is an invasion, and it's an arrival of another kingdom. It's a different kind of kingdom, and it's a different kind of a king that comes. Jesus was never intimidated by the Herods or Caesars or what they represented like you and I would most likely be. And it wasn't because, well, Jesus was so tough. It wasn't because of that. It was because he was so focused on a different kind of kingdom. Jesus lived a different kind of a story. And he lived it at a time when you couldn't always see the bigger kingdom. You couldn't always see the bigger story that was there. But Jesus, he lived it and he breathed it. And as big and as scary as Caesar and Herod were, and even though they, ultimate, they had the potential and they had the ability and ultimately they did actually nail Jesus to a cross, that is still the small story compared to the story that Jesus lived in. The story that Jesus lived in was longer. The story that Jesus lived in is bigger. And the story that Jesus lived in, man, that's why he was so rarely intimidated. While Jesus was doing his ministry, he didn't really have to deal directly with Herod. Because by the time that, that Jesus had grown up to be an adult, Herod had, had died and his three sons all had wanted a piece of dad's empire, and they each got a piece of the kingdom to rule. And, and while there were three, the three sons were in Rome, because the three sons, when, when Herod the Great died, his three sons went to Rome and went to Caesar, saying, Caesar, you need to parcel it out and divide it up. We, we all want our pieces. While the three sons were there trying to get their, their, their piece of the inheritance, you had these 50 dignitaries from Jerusalem who went to Rome, basically to say and plead with uh, Caesar Augustus, do not let the sons of Herod rule this country because they're going to just make, it's going to be so much worse. And these 50 Jewish delegates and dignitaries were scared at what any of the three sons might do, but they especially despised and feared a certain one. One of the sons was named Archelaus, and they were especially scared of him. He was ruthless. Uh, Caesar ignored the plea of the Jews. He picked the one that they were scared of the most, thinking that will uh, bring the most order for the country, Achaelius, and that made, they made him the ruler of Judea. And the first thing that he does when he gets back to Jerusalem is to call the 50 dignitaries that had gone to talk about him and to talk against him and to stop him. He calls them into the palace and has every one of them executed right in front of him. He was making a, a point, but he needed to make a point. I mean, he need, this is what kings do. Kings need to make a, a big impact. He can't let this go unpunished. If you're going to talk bad about me, I can't let this go. I need to set a precedent that I am the man who's in control. I am the man who's in power. I have author, authority. I am the king. I have a kingdom. You don't mess with me because I am now the one in charge of everything, and I am the one who wins. And with that in mind... The actual true story that just happened there, Jesus, he's starting to tell to his disciples in Luke 19, 11. He's sitting around with a bunch of the disciples, and he's like, while they're listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because, well, they were near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. And Jesus said, he's like, so I want to tell you a story. This is good. You're going to like this one. A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return home. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minas to put the money to work. And, and, and he said, until I come back. And, and, but his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. You know, he was made king, however, and he returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained from it. And then it goes on to talk about the money that was made in the three servants, but then the story ends, but those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Oh, well, that, sound, that sounds familiar to what actually 
happened. And Jesus is telling a parable about money and investing, and we can, oh, we could, we could write a sermon about that. Well, let's talk about money and investing, a parable. You know, he's told the same parable in many places to different people, different scenarios, but in Jerusalem, where he starts to tell this one, where Herod's son is ruling the same way that his father Herod did with fear and intimidation and power over crushing power. He tells the parable this way, and he kind of says it with a twinkle in his eye. You guys, I, I want to tell you a story. Did, did you hear the one about the guy who goes off to be king, but everyone hates his guts? <laughs> no one likes the guy. They can't stand him. So they send a group of people to vote him off the island, but it doesn't work, so he kills them all. <sighs> and if you're listening to this, You've been following Jesus. And he's telling the story. It doesn't take a smart person to figure out what he's saying because everyone knows what he's saying. And you know who he's talking about. You know what he's talking about. And here's the deal. You don't talk that way about rulers. And you don't talk that way about Herod. You don't do that. Because people like Herod, they rule with fear and power. And anyone listening to the Jesus tell this parable, they, they would... <laughs> They never would have even heard the parable. I didn't even hear that part. All they're thinking about, Jesus, you're in so much trouble. Oh my goodness, you, I can't, uh, I got to get away from here because I am not going to be anywhere. I, I'm not even going to be in Jerusalem because the soldiers are going to come. They're going to take you away. I, I can't, I can't do this. I can't do this. But Jesus, he had the strangest way of acting as if someone was really in trouble. <laughs> but it wasn't him. I think Herod is in a whole lot of trouble. Why? Because Jesus was living in a different kind of a kingdom. He was living an entirely different story, much bigger than the tiny puny story of the Herods and Caesars of the world. But in the, the little slice of life that, that we have, it's the Herods and the Caesars who, who look to be the kings around us. And they seem to have this bigger kingdom, which in our minds is they have a bigger story. But it's still nothing. It's still not the truth, even today. Herod's Mountain, the kingdoms of this world, they will be cast into the sea. And part of the Christmas story's punch is that it will be brought down. And it will happen in the most unusual way. It's not just that eternally they won't last, but the irony or, or, or the subtlety, if you will do the Christmas story, it's the way that, the, it's the way that they're going to get brought down. In unusual, small, subversive ways, like a 13-year-old peasant girl named Mary who simply said when she heard the possibility of this kind of kingdom, she said, I believe. Jesus told the disciples, if you believe, these kingdoms are going down. And Mary said, I believe. Let it happen to me just as you say. Luke 3.11, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Arteria, and Trachonitis, and Licentius, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. Luke, okay, thank you for writing all that down, Luke. I appreciate the history lesson. But honestly, why did you start, why did you start why do you list that? Why do I actually need to know that? Why are you listing them before you ever said, before you ever even said the word of God came to John? Because to me, I would think, well, that's more important. I think the names are there in that order on purpose, with intention, because in the first two verses, Luke identifies intentionally, on purpose, all of the powers, all of the kingdoms, and he's given them by name. This is the world that we live in. But that is not where God came. That's not where the word of the Lord came. That is not where the message of God came. 
This is the Christmas message. He didn't come to Caesar or Herod or his kids or the chief priest or even Pilate. It didn't come to all the people who had the power, they had the media attention, they had the ability to, they could, they could do it. They had all the power, they had all the status. They ran the world. But where God moves, where God comes instead is to an untitled and unwashed man, a sack-wearing, locust-eating hermit in the desert named John, which means when the kingdom of God comes, everything gets flipped upside down. Everything. Because now who counts and who doesn't count, who makes a difference and who doesn't make a difference, who has power and who does not have power, who is truly wealthy and who isn't, who is in a whole lot of trouble and who is not in any trouble, it all gets mixed up. It's the great reversal. That is the kingdom of God. For those who exalt themselves will be brought low eventually, and eventually, and trust me on this, that mountain is going to go into the sea. For those who have been humbled and who have humbled themselves, they will be exalted. And where a peasant, little young woman... <laughs> named Mary, from this tiny little town of Nazareth, is told that she will bear a son with the power of the Holy Spirit, and she will give him the name Jesus, which caused her to erupt in this astonishment and joy. She starts breaking into the song that she couldn't stop out of astonishment. She says, my soul worships the Lord because he has exalted the humble and the poor, but the mighty and the rich go away empty-handed. I go, what's going on here? This is such a subversive story, this kingdom of God. Merry Christmas, because this is our story. Where all of our ideas about who counts and who doesn't count, who makes a difference, who doesn't get to make a difference, who really has power, who does not have power, what is of real wealth and value gets turned upside down. So now you don't actually know where God might show up. You don't know who God's going to use because he might use a 14-year-old peasant girl named Mary. He might use a locust-eating, camel-haired hermit like John. He might even use someone like you. Or me, maybe. So Merry Christmas. I want to tell one more story, and it's the story of two cities, Sephoris and a town called Nazareth. Sephoris is a city that Herod built. And it's called by the historian Josephus, they called it the Ornament of Galilee. It is uh, similar to the palaces that he built uh, in Masada and Caesarea. Had this huge amphitheater. There were these public, enormous public baths and pools that were lined with marble archives and there were banks and there were temples and there was a theater that seated 5,000 people people easily. And Herod, he funded the city. It was an incredibly wealthy city. And he, 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 he constructed all of this through a system of taxation that made a very few people very, very wealthy. And, and it made a very large group of people very, very poor. It was a major city in Israel of trade and cultural exchange. It was a Roman city that ruled the area, that ruled the region. And then we have a second city, Nazareth. And most of us, we know about Nazareth. We've heard about it. But we, we may not be you know, fully familiar with all of it. It's, a, it's the town where Jesus grew up in. But what many of us don't know is that Nazareth was only three miles away from Sephoris. The entire town of Nazareth would fit on 10 acres of land. The population at the time of Jesus was around 200 people in Nazareth. 200 people lived in this tiny little village. Josephus, the historian, he talks about over 45 cities in that area, specific area of Israel, and Nazareth was never mentioned by, in any of the historical records because it literally had no significance. There's no value to this village no one cared about Nazareth. In the ancient rabbinic records, 
all of the writings that the Jews had, 63 towns are mentioned in villages. Nazareth also was never mentioned. There were no public buildings in Nazareth. There were no paved roads. There was no sewage system, no trade, no gold, no silver coins have ever been found there. There is nothing tiled. Nothing had been marbled. There were no columns. There were no mosaics on the floor there. There was no massive pool or a gazebo right in the middle where you could take a boat to get to the middle and have a nice picnic. Their food consisted of bread and olives and just some vegetables and maybe a little bit of fish. Skeletal remains of people that lived there around the time of Jesus showed that they had deficiencies in iron and protein. So if you were to catch the flu and you lived in Nazareth, if you had an infected tooth, if you got a bad cold, it could actually be fatal if you grew up there. So whatever romantic notions that we might come up with about Jesus being born in this beautiful little barn... Eh, it was a fearful thing to be born there, to, be, to grow up there. Half the population died at childbirth. The average life expectancy was mid-30s. That's about your whole life right there, mid-30s. That would take out almost the whole church right now. N.T. Wright said, you do, not have to be, have an, you do not have an accurate picture of Jesus if you don't understand this about him. He was a Jewish peasant. That was his life. And the fact that he was a peasant, it shaped his view of everything. He grew up in a town that, that was shaped by the thoughts and understandings of the time. Just as where you grew up in the towns and where you grew up, different parts of the country, size of the city, it shaped you for the better or, for the, or worse how you perceived and things that you might need to learn, other things as you grow up and maybe move to other places. So if you start to picture Jesus and his family in contemporary America terms, you know, we'll always, you know, well, we get a job, we're middle income, middle class, we're going to get a stable job, but I, I want to move up in my job. I've got dreams to be able to get a better job, maybe get into a different maybe management. I want some better financial stability. I'm going to be able to send my kids off to college. I've got ideas, and we're going to take a vacation, and we're going to try and do this. And we think, okay, I, I just, at what point am I going to have enough to retire, and I'm going to start working on my 401k, and I got my mutual funds and my IRA account, and, you know, we start to try and plan and manage. But the people in Nazareth, they weren't hoping that their kids would one day go to college. They're hoping, can we pay the Herod tax? <laughs> and if we do have enough, will we have enough to eat tonight? And they're hoping that their babies would be born alive. And maybe their husbands or wives might live to the age of 35 to take care of the family. Men typically did not get married till they were in their 20s. Even, early, even possibly late 20s. And they would, because they had to have a good job, a good vocation. They needed to have a great income, and then they could marry. Typically, they would marry girls that were around 13, 14 years of age. So by the time your kids grew up, if you're a dad, you're dead. You didn't see your sons or daughters grow up to be adults. There's no mention of Joseph once Jesus is an adult. Well, he didn't make it. That was how it worked for everyone. And that shaped Jesus, living in Nazareth. And what started to dawn on me about this is, is when I let this in, about, about that being shaped what shaped kind of uh, this view of the world, how, where he grew up. And, and, and I think about him being shaped by the city of Sephoris. And I go, how has that shaped me? Because where I grew up, where we grew up, where we live, I mean, it shapes the worldview that we're in, but we live in more of a Sephoris than a Nazareth. And that shaped me. And we don't need to dial into that and understand that too much because it shapes our understanding of our wants and our needs. And so for us, well, that tells you what it is that you want and what you need. And that is what has formed us. That is what tells us what we have to have to be content, what we need to have success, what we need to get admiration or security 
what we need to buy and what we need to possess, especially at Christmas time, to be content. It has shaped why it is that I never seem to have enough. Because we actually grew up in Sephora as a people. We are not Nazareth people. And that is where we have been formed in our hearts and minds. And we develop our ideas out of maybe what we think, well, God, this is what I need. If I'm going to follow you and love you, this is what I need for me to trust you and to believe in you and to maybe give you my life and my heart. But I'm only going to give you that if you give what it is that I think I, I need, what you will provide for me, maybe what you even owe me. Jesus taught his disciples to pray this way. Matthew 6, 11, he said, give us today our daily bread. And I bet when Jesus prayed that prayer, I bet he felt something different than when I prayed that prayer. Give, a, give me just bread today to eat, God. That's my prayer. And he felt something different in his spirit, knowing, knowing where Jesus lived and how he where he lived shaped how he thought. It starts to make me wonder if, if, if I would just be satisfied with bread <laughs> because that better be some really good bread. And it makes me wonder if Jesus grew up with different expectations and different demands on God. God, you're going to provide me this or you're going to give me this or you're going to give me a long life. You're going to protect me from things that could damage or hurt me. You're going to provide financial security, especially retirement, Jesus had different expectations and desires than what I have. And it makes me wonder if, if, if the Jesus who grew up in Nazareth heard, if he heard me pray, asking for the things that I ask for and demanding the things that I demand, and then when I get pouty, because I'm not getting what it is that I want, when I want it, the way I thought I want it, I wonder if, if Jesus who grew up in Nazareth if he heard my prayers, I wonder if he would even get it. Not, not even mad at me or us. Just like, it doesn't really make sense. I just don't, I just don't get it. I think, I think Jesus knew God differently than I do. And he needed God differently than I do. The town of Sephora, it's built on a hill. It's just a 10-minute walk uh, north of Nazareth. And, and, and if you were to walk 10 minutes out of Nazareth, you would get up to this little uh, hillside ridge, and from there, you could see, Na uh, you would see Sephora on the next ridge. And it's called a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. That's what, that's what they called Sephora. And, and the photo is, this is a photo from Sephora, but on that next, far, the far ridge line, that's, that's just a few miles away, that is, that's where, uh, that's where Nazareth is. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus was talking about how you come into the kingdom of God and, and what the people of the kingdom live like. And when people submit their hearts and their lives in this kingdom, they, they start to depend on God. They, they mourn and they grieve over the sin and the, the junk that's in their, their life. And they start to come desperately for God, saying, God, I, I, I need you, and I, I'm so sorry I've been trying to do this without you, and I'm so sorry for the pain I've caused, and, and, and I'm coming desperately, God, for your life, for your peace, and, and for your joy. And Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And I've got news for you. You are a city on a hill that cannot be hid. And I'm not talking about Sephora. And that's where the phrase came from. It came from where Jesus grew up. And with that information, you can almost picture Jesus as a little boy playing with his friends, wandering to the top of that ridge, and, and just noticing Sephora just off in the distance. It's just right there. It's this huge Roman city. It's just, it's just, it's just a stone's thrown away. We're just a suburb of this major city. Most historians believe that Joseph worked there in Sephora. And uh, that, it, that, that is where Joseph would have had a job as a carpenter. And a carpenter was just, it, it literally meant craftsman. So there's not a lot of trees in Israel. Woodworking was not much of a thing there. Uh, 
so it, the chance of Jesus or his dad being a woodworker is very slim. Most likely, what a an, an, uh, craftsman was was a stone worker. And they had a lot of roads and a lot of rocks to move at the time of Jesus. And they made a lot of mosaics for the Roman Empire. They tiled a lot of things. That was kind of their, their deal. And Jesus, as he grew up, he followed in the family business and possibly went to Sephora with his father to be a carpenter, a craftsman. Herod routinely hired craftsmen to build his buildings, to build his roads, to grow his kingdom. And I, I believe Joseph and Jesus spent more than just a little time working in Sephora, three miles away from where they lived. It's where the jobs were. If you wanted a job, that's where you go. Because Nazareth can't. I mean, there's, there's no jobs there. There's 200 people that are barely squeaking out a life out of the dirt. And when he was in Sephora, I'm sure he noticed the gap between the rich people and the poor people. And that shaped him too. Luke 4, 18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He grew up a peasant boy three miles away from luxury and wealth. And, and being around it, being able to see it, 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 it undoubtedly made him think, People who live in Sephora, I mean, that's about as good as it gets. I mean, that city over there, I mean, the kings and the kingdoms of this world, they just don't really do it much better than, than that right there. Herod, you're doing it. I mean, that's it. That's about, that is the dream. But here's the deal that, that we really need to dial into is that while he would acknowledge that, I'm sure Jesus would acknowledge that, I don't think he envied them, and I don't think he hated them either, nor do I think he ever aspired to be like them. I also don't think that he preached a message that said, well, if you follow me, we'll look just like that one day. We'll get everything that Sephora had. If you just have enough faith, if you just pray, you will get your wealth too. He never preached that. That was never his message. That was never his goal. Because Jesus was bringing a different kingdom. He lived in a different story. It was a much, much bigger story. And that's why he didn't envy Sephora or hate Sephora. It was just such a different story than maybe he was living in. It's a bigger kingdom than what Herod could conceive. It was bigger than what Sephora could ever contain. And it's kind of odd that, that when Jesus was around, everyone, I mean, everyone knew about Sephora. It was this ornament of Galilee. It was this magnificent city on a hill that you could not hide. At the time of Jesus, everyone knew about Sephora. It's one of the biggest most glorious cities in Israel. No one knew about Nazareth. Today, everyone knows about Nazareth, but almost no one knows about Sephora, except for us now. Because something was going on in that poor, tiny, and significant town that was part of a much bigger story, bigger than what Herod could conceive or Sephora could contain Something that raises the question again about who really is safe, who really is secure, and who isn't. It's a, about who is wealthy and, and who is really poor, about who is in a whole lot of trouble and who is in no trouble at all. Because 2,000 years ago, Caesar and Herod looked to be the strong ones. 2,000 years ago, Caesar and Herod looked to be the secure ones, the rich ones, the powerful ones. But as it turned out, they were just temporary kings with temporary power and a temporary kingdom. And it was a Jewish peasant from Nazareth who was a different kind of a king who was bringing a different kind of a kingdom, which is why a peasant girl from Nazareth may, named Mary, she started to sing this song in Luke. Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Herod... <laughs> Caesar, you guys are scary, and you're big, bold kings, but you are the Lord, Mary would say. You are the famous one. You are the glorious one. 
I want to pray. God, it is so easy for me to want to live in Sephora, to go after the things that, that, that I want, for me to ask you for the things that I want. And God, I declare, I want your kingdom today. I want it in my heart and in my life and in this community, in this church. I want to see your glory. I want to live your kingdom because you have changed my life and you have forgiven and healed and redeemed me. And my soul rejoices, God. And I praise you, God, that you are the Lord and that your kingdom reigns forever and ever and ever.